Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. You're very important to this process. And we're going to make sure that you have plenty of time to ask questions. I'd like to leave at least 15, maybe 20 minutes, so everyone in the audience will have a chance to ask questions. Um, I'd like to start by thanking our interpreter. It's, that is also a very important job, and uh, we're very grateful that you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my name is Suzanne Schadel. I have the great fortune of being the chief in the Hispanic division at the Library of Congress. And in that division, we get to make recommendations for purchases in the library. A lot of people don't know that we have the very books that we're going to be talking about today in our reading room, and that we serve those books in our reading room. And I would invite all of you to come and read those books, as well as a number of others that our authors here have written. And in addition to the books, we have some very accomplished writers uh, sitting here on the stage. They are journalists. They are novelists. They are short story writers. They are blog writers. They've done all kinds of work. And we have other work in the Library of Congress, too. And I'd like to invite you to enjoy their work in that context as well. So you can tell that I'm very nervous. The lights are um, blinding. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure that our authors are also nervous. And one thing that I do so that I don't get too ter terribly nervous, or you can't see my hand shaking, <laughs> is that, um, and you see my hands are shaking so hard that it isn't working the way that it's supposed to. Um, so I tend to take my notes and put them on my telephone so I can clandestinely look at it, and that's not working for us right now. So, um, so there you have it. It's always good to say you're a little bit nervous, and then we can get into the discussion. So um, I'd like to start real quickly by uh, introducing our distinguished panelists. I know many of you in the audience already know these women and already know their work, but some of you may not. And I want to I wanna say that it is a real privilege for me to be here talking with them. Uh, as you know from the title of this, of this conversation, we're talking to, to South American authors, uh, and I hope we'll get a chance to talk about that classification. I'm a librarian. I love to talk about classification. Um, Liliana Colanzi is from Bolivia, and Melba Escobar is from Colombia. They are incredibly different authors working in very different contexts, and it is a privilege for all of us today to have the opportunity to hear a little bit about about their work, but also to hear from them speaking their work and uh, telling us why that work is important. So um, I'm going to facilitate the conversation. My job is to get you all excited about these authors and about these books so you can ask questions. So let me just say a few words about each of our writers. Liliana Colanzi, here, is, um, is of course, I just said, a Bolivian writer. She's an editor and a journalist and an educator at uh, Cornell University. She also describes herself on Twitter as a paranormal researcher. <laughs> and in 2015, she was the recipient of the Aura Estrada Prize, which honors aspiring women writers under 35 writing in Spanish and living in Mexico or the United States. Melba Escobar, as I've said, is a Colombian writer, also journalist, book enthusiast from her Twitter <laughs> page. And um, she, her crime novel, Casa de la Belleza, which we're going to be talking about today. Um, it, <laughs> see, I'm already tripping over my words. Um, was chosen for the best books of 2016 by the Colombian National Novel Prize. So um, we are, as I said, very privileged to have two writers coming from South America who are not only stars, but rising stars. We expect to see a lot um, in the future. So this is a really great opportunity to see some great writers who are starting out, who are in the field and doing some wonderful work already. Um, I often find these biographical notes a little frustrating because if you notice, they end up getting repeated over and over and over. And if any of you have written biographical notes, 
you to. You know, sometimes it's the last thing that you really think about right before you're going somewhere, and after you've done it, you think, oh, I wish I would have said this. <coughs> so uh, I like to start with a question. Is there, is there something about yourself um, or about your experiences, I like to use the plural here, um, that you'd like to share with the audience? We'll start with Lilian. So we're, we're just going to go <coughs> alphabetically with Colansi and Escobar. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, thanks, Susan, Nelva, uh, and thanks, everybody, for being here. Actually, you have started with the most difficult question. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> what can we say about ourselves that it's we so deem important for the others to <laughs> you know? I don't know. Uh, well, this is my first time in Washington. And um, people advised me to go yesterday to the National Air and Space Museum. Uh, mm -hmm. So I did. Um, I was amazed by the fact that uh, it, it is free. <laughs> because I come from, up, uh, from New York, and you have to pay there for all museums. But anyway, uh, I was um, very interested in seeing uh, the recreation of the spaceship uh, that went to, to the moon. Uh, because I felt a connection with what I do, uh, which is uh, science fiction. It's one of the things I'm interested on. And actually, one of the um, short stories that I wrote, actually the ones that gives the title to uh, my book, Our Dead World, is about a girl who goes to Mars, actually, who is on an expedition to, to Mars, one of the first colonizers to, to Mars. And I was drawn to writing this story by <coughs> a, a newspaper a article about a Bolivian girl some years ago uh, who was selected to be on the first uh, expedition to Mars that apparently is taking place in 10 years. Uh, the project was called Mars One. I don't know if some of you have heard about it. But apparently, it's going to take 20 people uh, to, to Mars to build a colony there. And uh, this girl was only 18 years old when she was chosen. Um, she gave a number of interviews in, for the Bolivian press. And I was amazed by the fact that she said that, uh, well, of course, she loved her family. But she would give up all her love beings and all her life in, on Earth. Uh, in order to achieve something that, that, that was more important, to, to discover uh, another world, to uh, be part of one of the greatest adventures of humanity. So uh, that radical idea appealed so much to me. Uh, for once, because I, I feel, uh, well, I live in a very tiny town in upstate New York, which is called Ithaca. Uh, <laughs> which has incredibly long winters. Uh, winters are, are, are very harsh also, and they can last uh, for six months. So sometimes I felt like this, uh, I don't know, this uh, person in another world trying to survive these incredible, <laughs> incredibly hostile <laughs> conditions. <laughs> so my idea was to imagine how uh, or, or what a radically different environment could do to the mind of someone. And that's what triggered uh, the atmosphere of part of my short stories. But yeah, that's something that I wanted to share with you because um, as I went uh, in the National Air and Space Museum, like I, I was amazed by um, basically all, all the collection and, you know, uh, and to think that uh, America was actually one of the uh, fair countries to put like human beings outside our, our uh, planet, and that's quite amazing. Mm -hmm. All right, so somebody, somebody knew your work when they took it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's great, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. You made it look easy. <clears throat> Didn't look like a difficult question at all. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. It's, this is my first time in, in this uh, book fair, book festival. Um, okay, first of all, as you just heard, my name is Melba Escobar, and I normally don't have to spell my last name. Uh, you probably know why. <laughs> it, is, uh, it, it, it is funny now. It wasn't that funny in the 90s. <laughs> 
when I wanted to travel somewhere, anywhere, with like Melba, Escobar, born in Cali, Colombia, it was like, really? Is this a joke? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't have the best memories of traveling around Europe and <laughs> being extremely, um, how do you say that? Um, <laughs> Uh, searched exactly by police, but uh, I have to say that now it, it has a different uh, symbolism for me being here and having feeling that I'm, I'm also representing something of Colombia that is also Escobar, but that has nothing to do with Pablo Escobar or, <laughs> or with Marcos or anything like that. It's the only things they talk to you about. Also, uh, the famous old joke, like, oh, really? Was he your uncle? And I would say, really, no. I, I Probably I would be living a different life, and, and we are just <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't be so worried about trying to sell books. <laughs> but um, that's one thing I, I wanted to tell you. And the other thing is, um, I, when I arrived yesterday from Bogota, Colombia to the Dulles airport, I, um, and I called for an Uber and uh, the man who picked me up was called M M Mufasa, maybe, no. Uh, I don't know, it was a difficult name for me. And uh, he said he was from Iraq and uh, what happened is that in Colombia, Uber is illegal. So we have to sit in the front because it's a way of simulating that you are not a passenger, but you are just with someone going somewhere. <laughs> they are all like uh, normal cars. They have nothing different. And, and, and you just, I don't know, act like we're friends. <laughs> if the police stops you, it's like, we're friends. What's the matter? <laughs> so when the car uh, got there, I, I just opened the front door, and, and he was like, Okay, <laughs> and I sat next to him, and, and he was kind of surprised, but he didn't say anything. I just, <laughs> later on I realized like, oh, maybe I should have sat in the back. But then he started talking a lot, and he was like happy, you know, and, and he said that, <clears throat> that I was someone special. I guess he said that because I sat in the front. <laughs> But then I said, okay, probably you say this to every single person that comes here, and that's why you have uh, <laughs> a grade of 4.9. <laughs> and he said, no, it's not funny. I really mean it. You're someone special because here everyone, and there are no, because he said, why are you here for? And I said, I'm a writer. And he said, that's already something special. <laughs> said, but you don't know what I write. Maybe I write something awful or, or I'm very bad. <laughs> what do you know? He said, no, no, no. The only idea to write a book is you have to have something special. And I said, okay, I'm glad now. I, I, I feel better now uh, in my life. And uh, in the end, what, what he said, I asked him um, that I asked him if he missed his country. And he said, my country is wherever my civil rights can be guaranteed. So right now, this is my country. And that's the story. Wow. <laughs> well, you get a very uh, great introduction of two people who are observing and thinking through their experience of the world around them in their writing, and you certainly get that in the two books um, that we're looking at here today. Nuestro Mundo Muerto, which has been translated by the, uh, translated into Our Dead wor World by Jessica Siquiera. Um, that's the Dakely Archive. Mm -hmm. And uh, La Casa de la Belleza and House of Beauty, um, translated by um, Elizabeth Breyer. Elizabeth Breyer mm -hmm. in London by um, Fourth Estate. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I thought that it would be very interesting to start with you hearing the author's voices from what they choose in their book instead of me kind of going through um, pieces that I find interesting. And part of that is me um, 
meeting these two authors for the first time and thinking, wow, we have very, we have very different texts here and trying to find a thread that isn't South America, that isn't two women writing, that isn't about analyzing the human experience in different ways <laughs> would be really difficult. So I would like to start by asking them to do something we like to do in the Hispanic division, and both of them have agreed to do it for, for posterity's sake, and that is read from their works so that we can all hear those. I've suggested that they could read in Spanish or English. I hope most of the audience will not have any problem with Spanish. We'll be asking questions and um, delving a little bit more into those portions that they read in English. Um, I'm leaving it up to them, though, uh, because I would like for you to hear their voices and their works. So. Should I start or Mer Melba? I don't know. Should we go back and forth? <laughs> what, what do you, you like? think? <laughs> Whatever you prefer. I start? Yeah, you okay. can start. I will read in English because I, I, I have never read it in English, I think, so. <laughs> 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 Let's try it now. <clears throat> I hate artificial nails in outlandish colors, fake blonde hair, cool silk blouses and diamond earrings at four in the afternoon. Never before have so many women looked like travestites or like prostitutes dress, dressing up as good wives. I hate the perfume they drench themselves in, these women as powdered as cockroaches in a bakery, what swords it makes me sneeze. And don't get me started on their accessories, those smartphones swaddled in infantile cases in fuchsia and similar and covered with seconds, imitations, gemstones, and ridiculous designs. I hate everything this waxed, eyebrowed, non-biodegradable women represent. I hate their shrill, affected voices. They are like dolls for four years old, little drug dealer husses bottled into plastic bodies, bodies and stiff as the muscles on a man. It's very confusing. This macho girl women disturb me, overwhelm me, force me to dwell on, a, on all that's broken and ruined in a country like this, where a woman's worth is determined by how ample her buttocks and breasts are, how slender her waist. I'd hate the stunted men too, reduced to primitive versions of themselves, always looking for a female to mount, to exhibit like a trophy, to trade in, our, in or show off as a status symbol among fellow Neanderthals. But just as I hate this mafioso world, which for the past 20 years or so has dominated the taste and behavior of dogs, politicians, businessmen, and almost anyone who has the slightest connection to power in this country, I also hate the ladies of Bogota, among whom I count myself, though I do all I can to stand apart. And I'm gonna read the, fir the first pages of my short story, The Wave. The wave returned during one of the fiercest winters on the East Coast. That year, seven students committed suicide between November, November and April. Four threw themselves into the gorges from the bridges of Ithaca. The rest turned to the blurry dreams of drugs. It was my second year at Cornell, and there were still three or four years to go, maybe five or six. What did it matter? In Ithaca, all days merged into the same day. The wave always arrived in the same way, without warning. Couples fought. Psychopaths waited in the alleyways. The youngest students let themselves be dragged down by voices that whispered spirals in their ears. What did they say? You'll never be good enough for this place. You'll be the shame of your family. That kind of thing. The city was possessed by a strange vibration. In the mornings, I would put on astronaut boots to go shovel the snow, piling up like one castle above another, so the mailman could reach my door. From my porch, I could see the wave embracing the city with its long, pale arms. 
the whiteness refracted all visions, amplifying the voices of the dead and the tracks of deer migrating toward the false safety of the forest. The old dream had returned to visit me on several nights. Images of hell I won't say a word more about. I cried every day. I couldn't read, couldn't write. I could hardly get out of bed. The wave had arrived, and I, who had spent the last few years going from one country to another, fleeing from it, as if it were possible to hide from its icy embrace, stopped in front of the mirror to remind myself for the last time that reality is a reflection in the glass and not what hides behind it. This is me, I told myself. I am still on this side of things, refining my senses, only overwhelmed by the imminent feeling of something that I've lived through many times before. And I sat down to wait. Do you feel anything out of the ordinary? Asked the doctor from the university health system. A task with recording the persistence of melancholy in the student population. I don't know what you are talking about, I said. That morning, the shrillness of thousands, thousands of terrified birds flying over the roof of my house had woken me. How they screamed. When I, ride, when I ran outside to look at them, shivering in my damp slippers, all that remained were fine ash gray spirals mottling the snow. The wave had taken them too. But how could I tell the others about the wave? At Cornell, nobody believes in anything. Many hours are wasted discussing ideas theorizing ethics and aesthetics, speed walking to avoid the flash of other looks, organizing symposiums and colloquiums, but people wouldn't recognize an angel if it blew in their faces. That's how things are. The wave arrives on campus at night on tiptoe and sweeps away seven students and all the doctors can think to do is fill your pockets with trazodone or give you a lamp with ultraviolet light. Thank you. Okay. Now I'm going to ask questions and maybe talk uh, separately, individually, and then try to bring us all together. Um, so in Melba's case, you got the first couple. You got the first couple of pages, um, which you might guess from the title is set in a beauty shop where all kinds of wonderful services are offered, um, ranging from hair, makeup, nails, massage, so forth, um, to therapy. So I think you have described this book elsewhere as, um, as a psychological thriller. And I think that's what it is. It is a psychological thriller. And um, from the beauty shop, the story emerges and we follow the lives of many, many women who come into the beauty shop and who interact with um, uh, perhaps the most enigmatic um, staff member there who gets embroiled in a story with, um, with some of the, uh, well, with one of the other, two of the other customers, I guess, maybe several. So um, I, wonder if, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why those first couple of pages have um, impact for you. Why is it important to sort of set up that, that narrator in, in response to mm -hmm. uh, the women that are? Um, <clears throat> I think it is very difficult to be Colombian. <laughs> And uh, I believe that uh, at the same time, it's, a, it's kind of a passion that I, I have never been able to escape from. Uh, my mother is from Spain and a lot of my family lives uh, in Europe and also my sisters. And, and I have moved in, to different places in different moments of my life, but I always go back to Bogota, Colombia. And somehow I feel that there's a, a very strong, um, like adrenaline that you live in the everyday life is like a strong dog drug that you get addicted to and also there are many things that i love 
of my country. I, I believe that uh, most of the everyday life things are difficult to, to do, even to get into a bus and, <laughs> and not to get robbed in the bus and, <laughs> and arrive to the other side of the city in less than two hours or three. So everything is, is a challenge. It's so challenging that you can get somehow addicted to that. At the same time, I, I, when I, I lived in Barcelona and when I came back to Colombia and to Bogota, I, I felt so alienated and um, somehow I believe House of Beauty was my own therapy, my own way of, of trying to, to work out all, all this hate that is in the first pages and how it made me feel a strong conflict about it. I think that in order to have such strong feelings to a place, you have to love it, of course, because otherwise it would just be indifferent to you. So I guess uh, if there is so much hate, it's because there is a lot of love, of course, in this case. And uh, I, I wanted to, to process all that. And uh, so I was looking for a story where I could try to process uh, all, all the rage I felt for corruption and the mafioso culture and also this strong um, patriarchado, I don't know how you say in English, yes, uh, machismo. And um, I, somehow uh, this world of women that happens in House of Beauty uh, let, me, let me do that because um, uh, when, when I was little, <clears throat> I grew up in Cali, and I grew up in a world of women. The, my father had four sisters, and we were all day in a house. No one of them was married. No one of them worked. They did nothing. They just told stories the whole day long, and amazing stories. So it was paradise for me, because I was there always listening to the most absurd things you can imagine. <laughs> because they were extremely religious, but at the same time, they could be like satanic or something. <laughs> <laughs> so it was all day I was there and capturing all this. And when I was eight, we moved to Bogota. And it, it was uh, very tough because I left this world of, of this woman that gave me everything, that feed me somehow. Uh, so I have always felt that Women and stories for me are one thing. It's like a privacy, also intimacy. I feel that for us women, it's easier to get to a private and intimate level in a conversation. Uh, and I, I feel that's really strong and something that I appreciate and love a lot of my gender. Um, so in House of Beauty, what you find is a lot of women that are dealing with a lot of stuff in their lives. And somehow, that is also very Colombian. I, if I'm not wrong, Colombia is the place with more <laughs> beauty saloons in, in by meter, <laughs> something like that. It's, it's, it's crazy. You will find, I don't know how many, but every two blocks, there's a beauty saloon. And I think it's also because women go there to, to talk, especially to talk while they're having some excuse, like I'm going to make my nails, but that's really not about that. <laughs> Thank you. Liliana. <laughs> um, so that's a piece of several short stories, and in that particular piece, I, one of the things that's very interesting to me is that you sort of play a little bit um, with the perception of the reader. So even in the title, The Wave, mm -hmm. um, maybe some of our readers here are expecting that they're, they're reading a Bolivian writer, so they're associating the wave with South America, and they're not going to think of a wave of suicides or the oppressive cold of Ithaca or the way that a medical system is dealing with um, depression mm -hmm. and pressure <laughs> in a university, they're, they're maybe looking for something else. So there's always this sort of, you, you play with these kind of tensions mm -hmm. of the writer and the expectation, I think. Um, and I wonder if you, could, if, if you could talk a little bit about how you develop that kind of tension in a short story, which happens fast. 
Plus, as you know, Bolivia is a landlocked country, so <laughs> like uh, when you talk about the wave, you think about the sea, right? So it can al also be a little bit misguiding. Uh -huh. um, but I don't know, even though um, our dead world uh, has short stories that are set, for instance, on Mars or uh, in upstate New York, I feel like um, my, of course, all the stories have a very uh, deep connection to certain things that go uh, back to Latin America, mm -hmm. uh, like um, the idea of colonization. Like most of the stories deal with this topic, mm -hmm. uh, but also all the short stories uh, are mediated by my experience as an immigrant in the United States. Um, and of course, uh, all my experience, it is also uh, comes from upstate New York and from Cornell University. And when I arrived uh, to Ithaca in 2010, as I read from uh, the, the short story, uh, it had just happened a wave of, of suicides. I don't know if you remember or, or you read that uh, on the news, but uh, five or six uh, students had just jumped uh, from the bridges uh, into the gorges, that those magnificent gorges that surround uh, Ithaca. Uh, so when I, my situation as a grad student there, was um, influenced by this kind of atmosphere of gloom uh, that was part of the environment there. And, and it was interesting because at the same time, the university was doing a lot of things to cheer us up. <laughs> like uh, those years, we got lots of free uh, gigs and concerts. For instance, Bob Dylan was there giving a <laughs> uh, a, gig, a, gig, uh, a gig for free, also MIA and a lot of other artists. But we all knew that something very tragic had, that, had just happened, you know, and that paired up with the long winters can do to something to, to your feelings also. At that time, I was undergoing a, a period of insomnia, also triggered by some personal circumstances and uh, by the intensity of the graduate program. So uh, when I went to the health service uh, at, at the university, uh, I was prescribed anxiolytics, and I was hooked uh, to them for, for a while. So um, to me, what was also part of my uh, graduate student experience was the med medicalization of, uh, for instance, sadness or anxiety, you know, as a part of coping with competitiveness, no? Mm -hmm. So um, then I had to, like, basically um, detox from anxiolytics, <laughs> which gave me this uh, proximity to the experience of madness, you know, <laughs> which at the same time was um, the atmosphere that it is into my short stories. I consider this book, Our Dead, uh, Our Dead World, a book on ghosts, you know, all, all sorts of ghosts, uh, ghosts, ghosts of history, and also ghosts of traumatic experiences. Um, so that, all that is linked to, to my first years in, in Ithaca, and um, as you, you well mentioned, uh, there is also a kind of meditation about, you know, uh, how in this society we, we, we deal with uh, more structural problems in ways that, in a way, are blamed on the individual, right? Because probably there is something a bit sick on uh, how, like, we, we try to overexert our, ourselves to achieve an idea of success, and if, if you cannot achieve that, uh, then you need uh, medication in order to be good enough for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Time goes way too fast. Um, I'm going to yield my 
strange librarian questions because we have, uh, we have a little time and I'd like to open it up to this huge audience. Uh, you, you'll see that there are microphones sort of on either side. If you have questions for both of our authors or either of our authors, please um, take a microphone. I have a question for Liliana. I've been to La Paz a couple of times and I really like it. It's an absolutely fascinating city. My question is, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your interest in paranormal investigation. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, I'm not from La Paz, I'm from Santa Cruz, uh, but I love La Paz because I think of it as a very Martian city, actually. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you have been to La Paz, you know that there is ver this very arid landscape, but at the same time, you have the teleferico, I don't know how to say that in, uh, in, in English, but you get this amazing view of the city, uh, this brown city, you know, from basically, basically from, from the air. Uh, I have always been interested on uh, the ways in which our experience of reality starts disin disintegrating, right? Uh, so that's where my paranormal researcher thing comes from. Uh, that's also why I'm into uh, science fiction and that's also why I like um, uh, the Latin American fantastic because we all um, live uh, like in a consensus of what reality is. But that consensus is something that we fabricate in order to be able to survive. But that also is very fragile. Uh, in my experience, a period of insomnia, a period of stress, taking any kind of drug, even getting too much into religion, you know, having a, a, a mystical experience or, or something like that, can alter the way in which we experience reality. And that's um, what I was interested in exploring in my short stories. Also how we deal with the idea of death, which can be something uh, very, um, I wouldn't say paranormal, but, but, but very fantastic. In, at one moment you are in the world and in another, in, in another moment you don't exist. And, and the same with all the people you love and with all the people you know. So to me there is nothing more mysterious uh, than that, the idea of death. Uh, and I was interested in exploring how we deal with that uh, idea which can be overwhelming um, and also how we, we relate with a whole lot of things that we don't know, uh, including the fact that uh, there can be life in another planet in ways uh, in which we cannot even conceive because we don't have the senses to apprehend that. Uh, and with uh, the relationship with time and, and the stars, uh, the way in which we are so tiny that our life spans, life span means nothing uh, to the history of the universe, for instance. Do, do one of you have a question for Melba? Yeah, I, well, okay. for, for both. Okay, uh, okay. So, um, <laughs> I never heard of you guys until I walked into the room just now. So, and, I'm, <laughs> and my formative years as far as, especially with Latin American literature, I was a Spanish major with, with Cortázar, Garcia Marquez, and I'm listening to you, and you know, you're growing up in Macondo, pretty much, <laughs> and, and you're sort of talking about Casa Tomada, or some, you know, a, Cor a Cortázar, one of Cortázar's mm -hmm. short stories, the, the fantastic that you just uh, alluded to. So I guess uh, part observation, part question is, um, so th here's the thread, you know, from the previous generation to, to you guys uh, coming out of, of Latin American experience in literature. How do you see that connection applying to your work and to your, your development as writers? <laughs> Piece of cake, I know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, yes, I guess a lot of things have happened since that 
generation of the boom of uh, Latin American authors. And uh, I think that because many of these authors were so huge, are still, of course, huge, uh, my generation tried to make distance with them, take a distance and say, okay, no one ever will ever try to repeat anything like Garcia Marquez did. It's impossible. That's why he is who he is, because it's impossible to imitate. So it's like a chapter he, on his own, it's a chapter in literature. It's the end of that. So it's, it's difficult because it's like trying to kill your father. And uh, it's uh, sometimes you, you, you would like to be like him, but you have to accept that you cannot. And <laughs> so I think in, in my case, I, I speak only for myself because I don't have an academic history like Liliana. I, ha I haven't been studying in any universities and not in such good universities as she has studied and worked on. So uh, I have been more eating from everywhere. And I, <clears throat> I, I read a lot of American literature actually in my 90s and then uh, I, I came back to Latin American literature but I tried to find myself in a much more diverse and multicultural world also drinking from TV, movies, series. I think to be a writer today means also to to have and to nourish yourself from plenty of different waters and, and food. And in my case, I feel very at home with the uh, Latin American fantastic uh, from countries such as Ar Argentina and Uruguay, for instance. Uh, and Latin America is a continent in which realism, it is not the main thing in that respect. Uh, it, it is very different from the US in which uh, literary genres are sort of a bit more marginal. But in Latin America, uh, non-realistic uh, modes such, such as magic realism or uh, the Latin American fantastic uh, have been at the core of tradition. So to me, that's quite liberating. Uh, and I feel close to out, uh, authors such as the one that was mentioned, Cortázar, and also Silvina Ocampo, and other authors who have done amazing uh, works at, at um, working with the limits of reality, such as uh, Uruguayan Armonia Somers, or, or also British Mexican Leonora Carrington. Uh, so my relationship with um, Latin American uh, authors, especially the ones who deviate from realism, it is quite healthy and I keep uh, a conversation uh, either with uh, authors who are already dead, and also with um, authors who are right now renovating our tradition, such as Samantha Schweblin or Mariana Enriquez, who work with uh, horror and the, fanta the fantastic, for, in for instance, and who are doing very uh, innovative things. Mm -hmm. Sir, I wonder if I could ask you to come and ask the question after I wrap it up because I'm being instructed that we are out of time. Um, one thing that I, I do want to say, thank you for being patient. Um, one, thing, one thing that I want to say as we are wrapping it up is, you know, sometimes we classify and group things together, particularly in libraries, we love to do that. And in festivals, we love to do that because it's well organized and it makes sense. Um, but hopefully you've had an opportunity to see that these two authors, whether they're women or whether they are people, are sort of writing very interesting interventions with the human experience 
And that human experience isn't confined to South America or Bolivia or Colombia. Um, it exists everywhere, anywhere that you might think of. And as we try to sort of wrap our heads around places that we don't know, trying to sort of wrestle with that human experience is a very important part of the process of writing. There's a strong tradition in Latin America, of course, and there are strong traditions elsewhere. And we we're just really fortunate to have Liliana and Melba with us today to share their work, to share some of their ideas, to share their experiences. So I hope you'll join me in uh, thanking them for being with us today. <laughs>